welcome to another episode of What an Evision. Welcome to the first podcast dedicated to Paraguay football in English. As always, I'm Roberto Rojas, and joining me as always are Federico Perez, Maria Ritos, and Ralph Hanna. And guys, you know, we got a lot to talk about today. I mean, you know, we're already in a new administration here in the United States. We don't want to get too political, but we just also came back from a good interview that we had with Anything Palmeiras. We spoke to Kristen speaking about Gustavo Gomez, the captain of not just of our national team, but of Palmeiras, who will play in the Copa Libertadores final against Santos. But it's a really good interview for those that haven't listened. They should definitely check it out. The video is right there in our YouTube link, also on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So I guess we'll jump in with this, guys, because we got a lot to discuss. There's been a lot of movement going on in, in Paraguay at the moment, and I guess we'll go straight into it with Fede. I mean, Fede, how are you? And look at all the things that have been going on with Olympia. They've been quite busy in this market so far. And and I think it's it's reassuring given the fact that there had been such drama with Nestor Gorosito. There have been rumors of him that actually wanted him to leave the club for some time. His, his name was linked to, to San Lorenzo, ironically, the team that plays both the Romero twins. So, you know, it's it's looking like there is stability with Olympia now heading into 2021. Hey Roberto, how's it going? Uh, hi to everyone in What Any Vision. Well, yeah, honestly, Olympia is obviously always a team to follow in the market. They usually sign big players. You know, I thought they weren't going to sign this many players actually just because of everything that's been going on with COVID. I, I thought they were going to be a little cautious with, with how much money they spent, but I'm actually surprised with, with some of the names. I think even fans were actually surprised when they heard Marcelo Stigarria was coming into the squad, especially because of his past. He, 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 he used to play in Cerro Porteño. He never played in Olympia before. Uh, he's made a, a, a big career also outside of the country, playing in Italy, playing in Argentina. He even played an international final lately in Copa Sudamericana here in Asunción just last year with Colón. Uh, of Santa Fe from Argentina. So he's made a career out of himself, and uh, this is just one of the many players uh, Olympia has brought lately. We were just talking about Saul Su Saul Salcedo's situation with Huracan in Argentina, something similar to what happened with our national goalkeeper also, uh, Anthony Silva, who, who uh, left Huracan just a couple of months ago and is now in a Colombian club, uh, in a Mexican club actually, uh, playing. Uh, uh, Saul also wants out of Huracan because uh, most of the Argentinian clubs are having problems, uh, financial problems to keep uh, their international players. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, you, you would look at the Argentinian league and you would find uh, a lot of Paraguayans. Now you don't find that many. Most of them have chosen Brazil, have chosen other countries. They've gone for other options. And the ones that are still in Argentina apparently want to leave. That's the case of Saul Salcedo. And he wants to come back to the country. Uh, he wants to come back to Olympia. He told, he, he had a conversation with the president of Huracan. That's just one of the other names. Then we have Edward Lopez, a Colombian, 25 years old, also coming from the Argentinian football, another international player. Those are the three signings from Olympia. But I want to know Maria Brito's uh, opinion on this, especially because we're talking about Olympia. And I want to know just how she was doing, if she was throwing as much fireworks as Roberto was doing this week, celebrating everything that was going on. <laughs> yes, definitely celebrating here this week um, in all terms. But um, yeah, I just, I have a, you know, a couple of, uh, I guess, opinions about the, these uh, signings um, in specific with, uh, with Chelo Stigarribia, you know, the, the guy is, uh, is a little older than, than, than people want him to be. Um, you know, he's 33 years old and he's had a, a good career, like you said, Fede, and he's been everywhere, including Cerro Porteño. Um, but apparently um, even Gorosito was uh, really asking for, for, for Stigarribia to come to Olympia and, you know, hopefully that does uh, make him feel at home and hopefully uh, play well for the team. And, um, you know, uh, even though he, he probably has to fight it with a, for the position with Ivan Torres, but, um, you know, a lot of people from what I've seen, you know, a lot of fans are not really happy with this signing. You know, you want Olympia to sign uh, younger kids, younger players, uh, you know, like the other ones that are possibly coming in, like Saul. But 
um, I guess it, it will come with time to see how Estrella Rivia does with Olimpia. And he really has to prove himself because obviously he's never played with the, with the team. And um, in Cerro Porteño, I'm not so sure how he did. But in other in other teams, I'm sure he did um, pretty well to to be able to have to be able to be seen by Gorosito as well. So let's hope that it's a it's a good signing. Um, unfortunately, he's already coming in hot with with the fans, not really uh, happy with him. But we'll see. It. Let's just we'll, uh, they have to give him some time. Hey guys. Um... Let me start with, I'm blending in a bit to the background, so I've come in camouflage tonight. Uh, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't plan this, but here we are. Um, it's been a, been a busy week, a long week. Um, right where I'm sitting, actually, my daughter jumped off the trampoline that we have in our house, and there's a sofa right here and smashed her nose. So yesterday I was in urgent care, which was fun. Um, it's not broken, so we're good. But yeah, it's a long week, so I'm happy to cap it off with some, some football talk. Um, and this, yeah, let's start with Olympia. I think uh, they, they seem to be doing the best they can in the situation. So, so Fede, you said you're surprised by how many people they're signing. Maria says, you know, maybe someone like Chile de Garibia is, is a bit too, too old or, you know, slightly past his prime, he could be. And I think what, what Olympia are doing is there's a, there's a theme here, right? The three players they're signing or looking at are all coming from Argentina where the, the economic situation has, has you know, been very difficult on a lot of clubs and players, especially players that, that want to earn foreign currency, uh, want to convert the pesos back into foreign currency because of the devaluation of the peso. So Olympia kind of taking advantage of that, making some, some deals, bringing some players back in the case of Salcedo and Estigarribia, and then, and then taking, a, taking a chance maybe on the, on the Colombian signing, um, who to be honest, I don't know much about, um, and also it works for Olympia because again, Borosito was, has managed to, you know, pretty much his whole career in, in Argentina. So he knows his players, he can trust some of these players, he can see how they might fit into the system. Um, I think the, with Estigarribia, I remember when he's back at Cerro, he, was, he wasn't brilliant. He, he's lost obviously some of the pace. He, he was a, you know, he was that winger. I remember in 2011, I think Copa America and things, you know, he was this super fast winger. Um, you know, taking on players, beating players. Of course, you lose some of that with over time. And I think with, with Cerro, he, he struggled a little bit with some of the, the physicality. So he definitely has something to prove. Um, and then someone like Sal Salcedo could be, a, could be a very clever signing for Olympia because really until Polenta took charge of that centre-back position and, and that really took them in those final games to, to help win the league. But without Polenta... Early on, they looked, Olympia looked very shaky defensively, and someone like Salcedo has that quality. Um, I'm trying to remember Huracan, but I think he suffered quite a, quite a bad injury uh, when he was first at Huracan because he hasn't played a huge amount of games. Um, so you think, you know, he's, a, he's still very young, but, but let's hope he's, his recovery from that injury was, you know, has been full enough for him to be able to to really try and uh, try and help lift Olympia or, well, I say lift Olympia, they're the defending champions. So they say maintain their, their position in, in the title fight because that's what they're, they're looking to do. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's kind of, let's say, let's say shrewd business by Olympia because I think they're doing the best of what you can in this situation with the, uh, with the pandemic and, and without any fans in the, you know, likely for, for most of the apertura or maybe the whole apertura. So they know they're going to be losing some revenue there. This is usually the time of year, of course, that everyone does their big drive to become a socio, to get people to, to sign up, you know, and to pay their membership. But usually you're doing that so you can go to games. Now there's, there's not much incentive for people to, to be members of, of these clubs. So, of course, you know, the, the revenue is not going to be there like it was this time last year. So from that respect, I think Olympia, you know, doing some, some clever business with, with what they can do. I wanted to go back on that Saul Salcedo conversation, what we had before the show started. Um, you know, he's still young. And I think, like you said, Maria, I think Olympia would like to appreciate having much more younger players in comparison to what Estigarribia is. Not to say that 
both of them are, are scrubs to say the least. They are talented players and they're each right. But going back into Salcedo, I mean, look, he's 23. He's pl- he played in Argentina. He's had experience playing at Olympia beforehand. And he was also on the national team. Many people are arguing if, you know, going back to Olympia is, is a step behind. You know, it's not going forward where maybe someone of his age of that nationality should be abroad, should be in a Mexico, a USA, somewhere in South America, or even in, in Europe, like a lot of his fellow compatriots are doing. I mean, you know, if Maria actually wanted to go into you on that one, because it's like, you know, I think Olympia understand that they definitely do need it. And we've seen past players who were hyped up at such a young age you know, and then go abroad and it, it just doesn't work for them. And then they go back. I mean, is, is that something that maybe for Saul that he's still a bit younger, so he still has time that if he does well at an Olympia where they're performing well in the Libertadores, they win the league and, and, have, and he has a good performance and is one of the best players in the league that could project him into more interest into a team uh, abroad, be it here in South America, North America, or even in Europe. Yeah, definitely. I think I was actually going to say that, that, you know, in Huracan, he didn't have that much luck. So coming to Olympia and a much bigger club um, in South America, of course, it can expose him to much bigger, um, you know, other other clubs that can be interested in him if he does well, of course. But um, anyways, we don't know his exact situation. You know, maybe he just loves to uh, to come back he just loves paraguay and wants to come back you know to his his uh, mother country some of us do uh, uh miss our our you know we get a little bit uh homesick but uh regardless um i think he shouldn't he shouldn't miss uh this opportunity and he should definitely be coming back to olympia um i wouldn't take it as a downsizing or a downgrade because Olympia, in my perspective, Olympia will be a much bigger club. They just won, you know, the Clausura and comparing to 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 Huracan. So um, I think he's he would do a good um, a good step in his career to come back. Um, possibly, you know, he, he could possibly just stay the entire time of, of his career in Olympia and become a legend. Who knows? Um, there's a lot that can happen, but I, I, I wouldn't say that it's a it's a downgrade. I actually wanted to compare his situation to a couple of other guys that left uh, Paraguay and went to bigger clubs. We have uh, Escobar's situation. He went to Mexico directly from Terro Porteño to Cruz Azul. And then we have uh, Robert Rojas, who we talked about on, on these last uh, couple of episodes, who went from Guarani to a big club in Argentina like River Plate. So it, it, sometimes it comes down to that, actually, to what the deal uh, actually is for the player if it's a good destiny if it's a good place for him you know uh if he finds a good club to play at uh you, you're mentioning there roberto also Omar Alderete, that went straight to germany uh lately but you know he actually had to go to, uh, through a other place in in europe before making it to the german to the bundesliga but um I, i'm thinking about uh Saul's situation he went to huracan huracan uh, it's not a team that that plays uh, against the big teams. It's not it's not a team that that usually gets ready for the for the championships. They've been uh, playing for the relegation these last couple of seasons, so it hasn't been easy for Saul to actually uh, stand out in this team. The same happened to Anthony Silva being goalkeeper there. You know, it's just it's just a, a very hard moment for that team. And I think, unfortunately, these two uh, guys. I've been victims of that situation. It depends a lot on the team that you end up playing. Yeah, I think I think I I agree with both of you that, that going from Huracan to Olympia is, is not a step back, is it's a step up in in terms of Olympia gonna be playing Copa Libertadores, and so he he will have some exposure there. I think for Salcedo as well, he's I mean, he must be thinking I'm I'm gonna be a starting center back. I think he would. He would assume that, and I think he would be right to to assume that he would he would get in and, and slot in alongside uh, uh, Polenta uh, with Alcaraz, yeah, you know, now much older, taking taking kind of back seat. Um, but with with the general point, though, is that often, yes, I, I see Roberto's point as well. That often there's been that tra- that kind of progression of okay, I go to Argentina as like a stepping stone to help me 
somewhere else. So like Almiron did it, you know, going for Lanús. Um, and then, you know, you've, you've had a kind of a history of players using, using that as the springboard. Well, Gustavo Gomez, who we're talking about, uh, you know, now he's at Palmeiras, but actually he used Argentina to, to end up in, in Milan. But these are not normal times, right? I think I think with the with the pandemic and and the situation now, it's it's very difficult to to be finding you know these clubs in Europe that are that are willing to to spend. There is an opportunity in Britain. I don't know if you guys are aware, but because of Brexit, some of the rules have changed about how uh, football clubs can sign EU players. So before there was a big preference to sign players from the EU. Now non EU. Uh, players are, are just as interesting for the uh, for the Premier League clubs, and they're actually giving points. There's a point-based system, but they're actually including the youth games. So before they only looked at full internationals, but someone like Saul Salcedo actually played under 20s for Paraguay. He actually gets you know more points, um, so he he could possibly uh, go to a Premier League club. There is there is that those opportunities. But let's be honest, it's it's going to be very hard for him at 23, a centre-back going going into, into the Premier League. We, we don't see that very often. I mean, Balbuena was, is older. Uh, someone else that went as a centre-back was Paulo da Silva, so he was much older when he went to Sunderland. Um, so I think for Salcedo, this idea of going to, to Olympia is, makes sense. I mean, I would imagine Olympia want to grab him on a long-term contract, knowing that there's potential. Hopefully he, he can get a shorter contract for himself because that could be more useful. I mean, what he wants to do is use this cycle, use this year of Copa Libertadores, hope they progress past the group stage to get some exposure. And then he could make the, the jump that I'm sure he's looking for. He's, he's very friends with the Roque Santa Cruz who's going to play his last year uh, officially with Olympia in this 2021. Roque wants him to be in, in the club. And I'm just uh, quoting this. I'm just saying this because uh, Libertad also made a run to have this player. Carnero, uh, the new head coach of Libertad, wanted uh, Saul Sacedo to join Libertad. But uh, Saul Sacedo's intention from the first moment has... Uh, to, has been to go back to Olympia, his former house. Yeah, definitely. I think it, it will be a interesting case of what happens to Salcedo if he gets lucky. If he doesn't go to England, you know, maybe teams in Germany are going to be interested. Maybe, obviously, teams in France, Spain, Italy, whatever it may be. Maybe he goes to an MLS or Mexico, but I think it all depends on him, though. I think if, if he does maintain that starting role and becomes a vital player for Olympia in numerous competitions the interest is obviously there I think it only will rise if he does be more consistent on those performances and obviously now it's a good thing that you mentioned the whole England type of things are out because we're going into our next segment talking about a player that is on our minds I think obviously someone that we really highly rate uh, in terms of importance and but is currently in a situation that is not very good. And obviously we're talking about Miguel Almiron and his situation at Newcastle. Uh, Ralph, you had mentioned beforehand that a lot of pundits, despite the fact that, you know, heading into the beginning of the Premier League, many people saw this Newcastle side possibly just finishing mid-table or, or even if they were going to fight in the relegation race, it was, only a few pe- it was only a few people that actually thought that way. However, because of the recent run that they've had, and, you know, even though they are seven points ahead of the drop zone in the uh, in the championship zone, uh, Newcastle are really in a bad situation at the moment. And for someone like Miguel Miron, I'm pretty sure that he is not liking the situation that he's in right now. So now I think Ralph goes, I guess, heading into you on this one. Where do we go from here? What happens to Miguel Miron? I mean, you know, certainly he hasn't re-signed his contract. I know he came in with a high mark uh, value he was the most expensive player that Newcastle had bought um, at the time. It was like 25 million pounds or something along those lines. And given that his form has been a bit inconsistent um, during his time there, it's going to be really hard to for him to see if he can get a move out before it's too late. I mean, I know the transfer window closes in a couple of weeks. I don't know if he will actually leave during the middle of the season, but there is the case of him possibly leaving and, and you know, something I, I wouldn't blame him if Newcastle were to not survive in the Premier League and get relegated to the championship. How do you view this situation for, for Miggy uh, for the next couple months until the end of the season? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, this came to mind when I began listening to, to a lot of pundits in 
uh, in England because of course I, I like to listen to all the all the things back home and they everybody's talking about Newcastle being on this on this decline because like you say they still they still have a fair gap from the relegation zone but you have like the Fulham and Burnley uh, picking up points and so suddenly you're you're thinking there's teams are, are starting to do well and Newcastle is just getting worse and worse and even now Steve Bruce has changed his system a bit to try and play with two strikers it's not leading to anything they're still not having shots on target or very rarely um, so you think of someone like Almiron and you think he's got 10 days, nine or 10 days to kind of make a quick decision because he could, does he try and go now, you know, before the team could get relegated and, and start playing in a team that's going to create chances because he, he's wasted there otherwise. Um, another, you know, his other feeling could be maybe I just try and get to the end of the season and, and then usually in the, in the summer transfer window, you have more time to to try and find a deal and strike a deal. They, you know, all the agents and managers always say that this January transfer window is very hectic and it's very difficult to get business done because you're in the middle of the season. People are traveling around playing games at the same time. You're trying to to get a deal done. Um, but it was just, you know, for me, I think if, if I was Almiron, I would I would be struggling at this, you know, because you're kind of watching a team not perform there's no real signs of that they they're going to be able to perform you as a player your stock is going down because you're part of this team that's that's sinking and, and there's not much he can do he's you know there's only so many times he can he can try and create chances for for somebody to miss so um so yeah i was just thinking about i mean i mean maybe this is his time to to try and jump ship and and move somewhere else in in europe or even within the within the premier league Um, I was going to say, and it may sound a little bit crazy, but maybe he can, and because we spoke also about uh, Salcedo going back to Paraguay, um, <clears throat> it could be a possibility that he could go back to Atlanta. Um, you know, he has so much success there and um, currently Atlanta's not doing so well. So maybe they could need the, the help from Almiron. You know, he found so much comfort there. Um, and obviously the, it opened doors for him, but um, Newcastle is just not doing him any favors. Um, although it should be the other way or around, you know, Almiron should be helping Newcastle, but obviously he's, he's not given the opportunity. So um, I don't know, maybe a, a, a possibility, it could be that he could go back to the MLS. Um, maybe after the season ends, he could, um, go to another European club, who knows, but I don't know what you guys think. Take him to Atlanta, take him to Disney World, take him somewhere where this guy can be happy because uh, he must be depressed in Newcastle with that weather just itself. But and now with this team, oh my god, poor Miggy on your own. Uh, he should have left uh, when, when he had the chance, that's what I think, right? Uh, but who? who who would have thought that the whole COVID was going to happen, that this team was going to do this bad? There, there was a rumor that the team was going to get a lot of money before COVID also. They didn't get that. They couldn't They couldn't build up a team. I think that was very important. And that's why uh, this team has just go, gone down and down. You know, the team looks like they're sinking, just like Raf is saying. Uh, they're, they're not playing better. I was reading stuff about Bruce, the, the head coach, and... They're actually putting more people around him to work with him because they don't know what else to do with the head coach. They don't know what other solutions to come up with to make this team play a bit more. Maybe they should let him go, like Maria, Maria saying there. But uh, I don't know what the solution, I don't know what, how they're going to solve their problems. I'm just thinking about our pair of wine star. I'm thinking about Miguel Amiron. And this is Newcastle's worst uh, time since he's been there. This is the, the worst moment since he's been a, a player of Newcastle. So I just, I want to see him happier. I want to see him playing. I want to see him scoring goals. And it doesn't look like he's going to be able to do that in Newcastle this season, Roberto. I, I think I do understand Maria's point to a bit in saying, yeah, I think Atlanta would be a nice choice because it was the place that got him his chance um to go to Europe obviously he's had a good relationship with the fans the players they have a new coach in Gabriel Heinze who 
play in a similar style that Tata Martino had played under Miguel Miron. So clearly it feels as if there's another Paraguayan as well with Eric Lopez coming in. So there's a lot of factors that could go in of him going. But at the same time, guys, you know, let's say that he is the most important player on the team for Paraguay. Let's, let's understand that he is the star jewel, we could say, because he's the one playing in the Premier League and doing well. Wouldn't it be more wise for him to stay in among the best leagues in the world? You know, I had, I don't know how true this is, but he's had interest from other clubs. You know, this isn't the case of just Newcastle and that was it. He's had interest from teams in the Premier League. He's had t- interest from teams in Spain and Italy and Germany. So this isn't to say that his options are just going to be MLS or whatnot. So I think given that his age, he, you know, he's only 26, 27 He's still in the prime of his career. He's got a couple years left to prove of what he can do in Europe. So I think it's just when the season does end, I think that's a time, and obviously it all depends on what happens to Newcastle at the end of the season. But I think regardless of what they, of what he does, I think he just needs to look at his options in Europe, see where he can go, see what kind of system works, because clearly the one that Steve Bruce is playing in is not the one that suits him. And we see that with just the team, how they're performing. You want to be on a team um that likes to go on the attack likes to go on full pace so there are a lot of teams out there that do play that system so I I think it's just a case of just looking at their options seeing what works if there's nothing that really convinces them then maybe Maria yeah why not go again and try in MLS and if if it goes well again then maybe he can go back to Europe at a young at a later age but then then that poses the more difficult question how many teams will want to have Amiga Amidon when he's in his 30s at a big club in Europe? That, that's the big dilemma there. So, yeah, as Ralph said, I mean, and I'll close you on I'll close you on, on this one. The situation that he's in, not just as much as what's been going on on the pitch, but off the pitch, it feels as if, though, he's at a crossroad. It's like, do I want to stay here? And mind you, in England, he's um, he's done well. He's Well, he's, he's earned a lot of money. He's earned, like, over a million dollars in his salary. You know, he's supposedly the best league in the world. The attention is going up there. But at the same time, you're like, this isn't helping me for my career. I want to go see my options. And and I want to also be in the best form that I want to be when I go and put on the Paraguay shirt for the big games that are coming up in the World Cup qualifiers and the Copa America. So it's... Uh... Yeah, and I'll just say one thing, uh, talking about the other Paraguayan in the Premier League, Balbuena, he's, he's not playing right now. Um, but West Ham could actually go above Liverpool in the next round of games. They're, they're two points behind Liverpool. Liverpool have to travel to Tottenham. West Ham play Crystal Palace. So, you know, Balbuena is actually in a much nicer position than, than Almiron right, right now, which is maybe something we, we weren't expecting. Um, but, but, yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, I... I would, you know, if I was on Miron, I'd be, I'd be trying to, to find my way out and, and definitely staying in Europe. I think the, the difficulty of MLS would also be with the seasons. So if he went now, it would work because of the season, well, they think the season will start in March, but it would be much better a loan deal that, that then he would, you know, once you get it back into the MLS and it's a bit difficult with rights because if there was some difficulty in terms of the sale to Newcastle because the MLS holds some of the players' rights and, I don't think he would want that that kind of complication now. If if there was a, a loan option, that, that could be could be interesting because then he could, you know, be using his time on loan, but but his agent is is finding a place for the, you know, for him to move permanently. Exactly. And it's good that we go on to that discussion on MLS as we close it out. We do see some potential departures and also some arrivals for our Paraguayans. So the big one that we do have to mention, at least in terms of arrivals coming into the United States, is the arrival of Rodney Redes and Cecilio Dominguez. They had just arrived in Austin, meaning that they will be joining the team that uh, will debut in uh, in MLS if it all goes to plan in March. So a lot of good things going on there, but also with Guarani's case, it's almost as if now they're trying to rebuild and they have been rumored with some people as well, Fede. On, on who to get. But before I get to that, we also have to mention the people that are leaving the United States. And that's one Kaku Romero. Kaku Romero has been in the rumors uh, recently, in the headlines, because of a supposed move to Saudi Arabia. 
a, a, a move right out of right field. I, I did not expect this type of situation to go on. He's had interest from multiple clubs, but you know, Fede, before we go and talk about what, what I need have to deal with, with the departure of Redes and Dominguez and also Romagna, who's going there. What do you think of this situation for Kaku? Because, it, you know, going to Saudi Arabia is not exactly maybe an upgrade in terms of quality as a player. I mean, I'm sure he'll get a good paycheck because of the money that they get over there in, in Saudi Arabia. But I, I'm also just worried about, you know, what this means for him going on to the national team because as you remember he scored the goal against Bolivia in that in that draw he when he does play he does become effective getting goals getting assists do you feel like this is the wrong decision for him to do and, and go to Saudi Arabia right at the this point of his career and where he's dealing with with the national team I'm shocked Roberto I can't believe this is actually a rumor I can't believe this is actually true even I, I don't want to believe it seriously uh just because of the plays that we're talking about, uh, Saudi Arabian football, I mean, that's not, that's not really a, a big level for, for, a, for a guy that's looking to play in the national team also, you know. Uh, Kaku Romero was on vacations these last couple of weeks. I think he was in Argentina visiting some friends, visiting some family members. And this news actually came up. It still hasn't been confirmed by, by him. But what I do know is that he's, he's had... Uh, problems with uh, his his last team in the MLS, uh, the New York New York Red Bulls. And he had some contract problems. Uh, they 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 were they were trying to renew him, and apparently they didn't do it in the right time. The papers they didn't send them in the right moment. They they send the they, they send the, pep, the papers late, and that actually gives the opportunity to Kaku Romero to leave the club without leaving a, a single cent for the New York, which is actually surprising and something that other teams can take advantage of, right? These all big teams are going to look into a player like him. And if you don't have to put any money to another club, that's even a, a better deal. I'm not surprised that he would, ha that he would have all these opportunities, that he would have all these offers on, on the table just because of his good, uh, just because of how talented he is, just because of he's just because he's playing also on the national team for Paraguay and everything that he's done lately. Uh, but I just, I don't want to see it happening. Seriously, I would rather that he would stay in the MLS. I would rather see him play here in South America. I would love to see him play in, in the European football, but I, I don't see him playing in Middle East, especially because he's just 25. But if, if money's on his mind, uh, why not, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the first thing that comes to my head when I think about these places. When you talk about... Uh, Chinese football, when you talk about Saudi Arabian football, I'm just thinking that these guys are in it for the money uh, or are tempted by tremendous contracts that come their way. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, I mean, I always think of this, when, when you hear about these offers to, to, somewhere, to somewhere like Saudi Arabia, when you're playing in the MLS and you're, and you're hoping, you know, you would think the logical next step in career development is is Europe but then you think it's you know this is a job for the players and if you're getting paid that kind of money and your career is only going to be another seven or eight years unless you're like Roque or or Paulo da Silva or someone and going on into your 40s so maybe you know it's is that kind of time where you think well I, I'll go and and make some money and and often I, I you know I spoke to a lot of players in Paraguay uh, players that have been have been to places like like China, in the case of uh, Nelson Cuevas, I remember talking to him about it, and he said, I mean, he didn't like the experience, but it was worth it for six months or for one year. So if you get the contract, and make some money, and then still have time to to come back, I would if I'm if I'm Kaku Romero, I'm sure I've had a maybe a text message or something to Berriso to to kind of test the waters about, hey, I'm thinking of going here. He must have some confidence in that Hernan Perez is in Qatar and, and Hernan Perez is still being called up for the for the squad despite playing in Qatar. So I don't think Berriso is definitely going to cancel him out of the national team just because of the league he's playing in. Um, but I would be I would be thinking about that because yeah, money is one thing, but the career development and then also playing for your for your country is is so uh, you know it, that's what that's what you dream of as a kid when you're when you're uh, you know, when you're thinking of being a football player, then you want to represent your country. So I don't think 
he'd want to give up that opportunity. So I'm sure he's checking that out as well before he, he, he makes any decision. And maybe, of course, this rumor could be thrown in by an agent. These things often happen at this time of year. The agent throws in some something, and now we've all learned because of this that his that basically he can leave uh, New York Red Bulls for free. So, so that was maybe the you know just making sure that all the other clubs are aware that, that they have this this chance. You you never know. Um, I was going to say that it's kind of funny how. Um, Kaku will go from MLS, which was considered a retiring league, to another retiring league like um, Saudi Arabia or Chinese league. So if he's thinking about retiring, maybe it's an option. Uh, but he's still young, you know. He still got a, he still has a lot to to give and prove. So um, if I were to talk to him right now, I'd say, hey, just uh, wait it out and. If you want to have money later on, then retire there. But as of right now, you should definitely um, look at bigger options. Yeah, I don't think if he does go to Saudi Arabia that he's going to have his career end. I mean, we've seen a lot of players go to those type of leagues where they would earn a lot of money, but then, you know, they're there for a couple of years and then they go back to uh, their other countries. So I, I think, and the best example I can give you is Oscar Romero, who, you know, he was playing at Cerro, he went to Racing, then he went to Spain, then he went to China. Now he's in San Lorenzo, and obviously we know the drama that's been going on with him and his twin brother. So, yeah, this is a weird one for Kago. I mean, I, I don't know if it's the right decision. I, I think certainly, yeah, if he goes, he's probably going to be financially set for the rest of his life, and that's super important for his family, um, given that also the background he comes from. I, I would assume it's going to be vital to make that much money to secure the, the stability of your family and those that are in the surrounding circles. So yeah, I think it's, it's a weird one. I mean, there have also been some rumors of him going to Turkey, which might be a better option for him because Turkey is a more competitive league. Um, there are players out there that have also been on the national team. We talk about Brian Samudio, Adam Barredo, who, are the, who was there at the same time. So maybe that's another option, but yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see what happens if he does make that move eventually to Saudi Arabia, what it means for him in terms of his future with the national team. And of course, you know, that, that position that he's in as an attacking player, it's a lot of players that are in that position and want to be in that position. So a run of bad form and Beniso can start thinking, okay, wait a minute, you know, I got to start looking at other options, you know, because I can't just have someone that's out of form that I can't trust in my national team. So he looks at other options and youngsters that are coming up, players that are abroad, that kind of thing, you know, like a, obviously it's like a, a full circle, like a Cecilia Dominguez, a Ronnie Redis and Eric Lopez, those guys who are at MLS and are much more um, in tuned and are much more viewed by many people. They're looking at them. He's probably going to be thinking, wait a minute, I want to see what the, those guys are doing and let's see if I can bring them onto my national team for these big games. So yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be weird. It's going to be interesting, but you know, it's, it's guys, it's, it's to end the discussions all a bit about transfers. People are moving, people are going. It's uh, I guess money makes the world go around to, to end on this note, but uh, no guys, again, thank you so much for tuning in as always, you know, we are so close to hundred subscribers on YouTube. We would appreciate it if everyone can go and give a subscribe to reach that goal and obviously you know follow us on twitter at guarani vision give us a like on youtube give us a comment be it positive negative feathers green shirt whatever it may be we will appreciate every single comment out there so again for myself roberto rojas for maria ritos Fede perez and ralph hannah thank you so much for listening in see you soon